three tenses of our one salvation. We've gone through this justification tense, and now we, um, we're looking at po our positional sanctification, and then we will begin to look today at practical sanctification. In other words, taking this, this teaching of who we are in verses 1 through 10 and putting it into boot leather and verses 11 through 8, 17. So that's going to be a big section there of actually getting this teaching down to where it actually is meaningful in a practical way in our lives. So, but in order to, to apply uh, the truth, we must know it first. And that's what you see, as Carlos pointed out yesterday in verse 3 of chapter 6. He says, do you not know? Verse 6, knowing this. Verse 9, knowing that Christ, and um, the, there are certain things that you must know in order to benefit from it. Uh, be like um, having uh, been given money, but no one tells you you've, you've been given that money. So you don't spend it. You have it, it's yours, but you don't take advantage of it. This happened to Wanda and I once. Um, we, were in, uh, we were in Venezuela, and uh, every month we would get a notification that we had been given our voucher and how much it was, and it, it would be deposited in, in an account in the United States, um, and uh, we'd have that money then to use during the month. And for some reason, and I always blame Wanda, but I'm sure it wasn't her fault, we didn't write down the money one month. And so during that month, we were eating beans and rice, and then we... To change it up, we'd eat rice and beans, and uh, we went for a whole month just, just suffering, and then all of a sudden, by the time our next voucher came around, we realized that we had had money in the bank that whole month, and we just forgot to put it in the checkbook, write it down, and uh, it, it was painful, but we got to go on vacation as a result, because <laughs> we, had, we had a month's worth of money. <laughs> to spend, to blow. So what was bad on the one hand turned out to be good on the other. So we're hoping that as you understand who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ, you can take this truth to the bank and that it can be something very usable and practical in your life. Now I hope you've seen this most critical piece of information that you are dead to sin. And that is... Um, that is very backwards to the way we look at it. We, we often think that no, sin, the sin nature is dead or, or we must eradicate the sin nature. We've got to kill the sin nature. We've got to defeat it. And Paul just simply states, no, we are dead to sin. And that's his rationale for why we should not sin is because we are dead to it. And, uh, and to, to that simple statement can be elusive in a sense. What does that mean? How is that practical? And I think that it is very practical and very meaningful if, first of all, we'll understand it, and then we will begin to realize that I don't have to sin. I do not have to follow the sin nature. Because it seems like in us, everything cries out and says, you have to do this. You know, We get to the point where we think, I just can't help myself. This is the way I've always been. This is the way I'll always be. And, um, and it's, we can almost get to be defeated when in reality the Lord would say no. But on the contrary, you are dead to sin and you are alive unto God. And you are not the prisoner of the sin nature. Uh, you are, are free from its ravages. And remember we've looked at chapter... Six, and we've been interpreting sin in the singular as being the root of sin. And go to chapter 7. Uh, Carlos alluded to these scriptures yesterday, but did, didn't actually read them. But chapter 7, verses 17 and 18, ex explains what this sin is that is in us. So verse 17 says, So now no longer am I the one doing it. Wow, what a... What a free pass, you know. I'm not the one sinning. So he's giving himself excuse? No, not at all. But he is explaining where the source of sin is in our lives. He says, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. Sin singular that dwells in me. For I know that 
nothing good dwells in me. Wow, he had the Holy Spirit, and yet he's saying nothing good dwells in him? Well, he has to explain it then. That is, in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Verse 19, for the good that I wish to do, I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very thing I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. And so we have this sin singular which dwells in us, the sin nature. And, um, and the Bible says, though, in relation to that sin nature, you are dead. And uh, you are to count yourself dead. And then we've gone through, how did this happen? How did we get this to, how did this come to be? Well, let's go over to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. Um, actually, before you get to Galatians, let's go to Ephesians, chapter 1. We're going to kind of take a little quick trip here. Ephesians, chapter 1, um, verses 13 and 14 say this. In him, you also, after listening to the message of, of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him, sealed in Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit of promise. And who is this Holy Spirit? He is the one who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view of the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. And so at the point of our salvation... Uh, we were given the Holy Spirit, but also the Holy Spirit took us and sealed us in Christ. And what this means is what we find in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 27. Actually, we'll read 26 and 27. 26 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So at the moment of your salvation, at the moment of believing in Christ, you became a son of God. Verse 27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And so there was this moment when you were baptized into Christ. Now, Romans 6 describes the, this baptism into Christ. What happened on the day of your salvation is not that God took you and took you straight to heaven and deposited you in Christ. What he actually did is he took you back across time and placed you into the death of Christ. You were united with Christ in, the, in his death, resurrection, and his uh, death, burial, resurrection, ascension. And as Ephesians says, you are now seated with, with, uh, in God with Christ. And so the way he put you into Christ is through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Now, how can God do that? Well, God is God. <laughs> he can... He, when he unites us with Christ, he unites us with Christ in his death. Go to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. It says in verse 12, it says, For, as many, for even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, they are, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. So we have this one Spirit that we've all participated in. But that one Spirit has deposited us into one body, the body of Christ. But Romans 6 tells us how he did it. And let's go back to Romans chapter 6. And this is something that every believer should know and understand. Verse, three, uh, verse 2 says, May it never be, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? So he makes this incredible statement that we are dead to sin. But then he says, Or do you not know? Because it is possible that Christians would not have this information down. And you might miss it. In fact, most of us are never even really taught this, it would seem, in uh, you guys are blessed in a church where they do teach the Word of God, but you can go across the United States and find that people have never been taught this truth, that in their being united with Jesus Christ, they were baptized, placed into, identified with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. Look at verse 3. Or do you not know 
that all of us who have been baptized into G Christ Jesus, not into water, into Christ Jesus, the person, have been baptized into his death, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So as Christ was raised, we have been raised so that we might walk in newness of life. Now I'd ask you, will Christ ever go back and take sin somehow on himself again and deal with sin, handle sin like he did in his death? Never again. You see, the death he died to sin, he died to it once for all. It was a done deal. He, sin uh, is completely done as far as Christ is concerned. And he, what separates him from, from sin is the, is the, is the burial. The, the tomb is a, is a gulf between sin and Christ today because when he was raised, he was raised to newness of life. He will never die again for sin. He will never uh, deal with, um, like it says in Colossians chapter 2, go over to Colossians chapter 2. He will never have to deal again with principalities and powers, with the enemy. Um, in Colossians 2 verse 11, says this, And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In other words, when Christ was cut off in his death on the cross, you were also, you also died in that death. Because look what he goes on to say in the circumcision of Christ. It says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God. He's going back to the same teaching of Romans 6, but he calls it a circumcision in that sense. When Christ died on the cross, when he was cut off, in that, in that moment in him, we were also identified with him in that but he was buried and raised to newness of life and what did he do there look at the verse uh, at verse 12b it says through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead and when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh he made you alive together with him having forgiven us all our transgressions and have having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, when he disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. And so um, he dealt with the demonic world. He, he dealt with um, the world system. This is why in Galatians, Paul can say, I've been crucified to the world and the world unto me. You, you see, in our relationship with Christ, the sin question has been dealt with because Christ, as it were, handled sin one time. But now that he has been raised, he is raised for the purposes of God, raised to newness of life, raised to strictly uh, relate to God because sin was dealt with completely on the cross. And so you, in him, Receive the benefits of what he has done. His victory over, over the demonic world. His victory over the world system. His victory over sin singular was dealt with. There are other things that were, were, he, was, he dealt with as well. Go to Romans chapter 6. Verse 15. Verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law? But under grace, may it never be. Um, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves of obedience, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? And so he has dealt with, with the, the, this law system. Look at verse 14 up above. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And so we have been freed from the, even the realm of law through this death with Christ. We have been freed from the way the world deals with things. Go to, go to Colossians chapter, chapter 2. How does, how does the world deal with sin? 
Well, they say they, they deal with it like George Bush Sr. Just say no. You know, just say no to drugs. That's the world's elementary way of dealing with sin. Slap you on the hand. Um, and look at chapter 2, verse 20. If you have died with Christ, when did we die with Christ? Well, when we were united with him in his death through this working of God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, what are these elementary principles of the world? Well, they are found in verse 21. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Then why, as if living in the world, do you submit yourself to commands of men, this elementary way of dealing with sin? That's the world's way of dealing with sin. Just say no. But we have died to that system. We have been buried and raised to newness of life. We are living in this, this sphere of, of grace. And so God has a way of, of making us to be holy people, of leading us on from victory to victory. Um, as Colo uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 says, He always leads us in His triumph in Christ Jesus. We have now been raised to a different realm. We, are, we were under this ministry uh, of condemnation before, under the law, but he, we are now under a ministry of life through the grace of God, as 2 Corinthians chapter 3 would teach. And so we should not go back to this old way of looking at life, which is very elementary and is a very man-centric way. We have died to that whole realm. We have been raised to newness of life. Let's set our affection on things above. Let's uh, look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. As Colossians chapter 3 says, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed from, from glory to glory. Uh, and this is where God would have us uh, live in a different um, with a different mindset, based on the truth of Romans 6, we have indeed been identified with Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And we are no longer alive to sin. We are now alive unto God. We are dead to sin and alive unto God. And if you'll begin to understand this principle, then you can begin to live by a whole new principle. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. For the law, and we'll, we'll see it when we get to chapter 8 if we get there, that law is the word nomos in the Greek, and it, it, means, it can mean anything from the Ten Commandments to a principle. And here it's, it, we would interpret it as being a principle. For the principle of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the principle of sin and death. So there's two principles, there's two ways of living. And the old way of living before we were saved was under this principle of sin and death. We sinned, we died. That was what we knew. We lived under the tyranny of sin and the consequential death from that. But now we are under this new realm of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And that's what he's trying to teach us, to, to live in a new a newness of life, a new way of living, and not to go back to the, to the old way. But the way he did that was he identified us with the Savior in his death, burial, and resurrection. And so we, we've gone through chapter 6, verse 6, saying where it says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. And now we pick up 8 to, through 10 in today's study. Now if we have died with Christ, and we have, we believe that we shall also live with him, and we will. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is, to, is never to die again. Death is no longer. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And so may the Lord teach us this, these truths here. Now there's an important, uh, actually we went through, that's, uh, I got to jump ahead here I believe. 
to verses 8. Um, get up to speed here. All right, here we go. So there's some, uh, I think we're on page, what, 30, 37, yeah. Some important practical results of our identification are death and new life in Christ's death and resurrection that you should know. So here are some important ramifications or results. First of all, now if we have died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. And have you died with Christ? Yes, you did. When did you die with Christ? At the moment of your salvation, uh, when you were baptized into Jesus Christ, in unified with him, identified with him, you were baptized into his death. And um, what is, what, um, that victory becomes your victory. You, you died with Christ. In the future, your death with Christ is so valid that even though it is appointed to man once to die, as Hebrews 9.27 says, should the rapture happen today, you could go straight to heaven without dying. You do not need to die. Why? Because you have already been united with Christ in his death. And so his death counts for your death. Now, of course, if you don't live long enough, your body will expire. It's got a certain shelf life. And then once, once that shelf life is over, it's over. But if the rapture happens today without dying, you can go straight to heaven. And, and that is because Christ's death on your behalf is, is valid for your death, even for your physical death. And so this is what I believe he is re- alluding to here when he says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, and we shall. Now if is a first class condition, meaning the speaker assumes a reality. If and it, and it is for sure, we died with Christ. Then we believe we shall also live with him, and you can be sure we will. So, you know how you look forward to this future resurrection or future rapture? And how you believe that and how that motivates you in life, knowing that even if you die... You're immediately going to be soul and spirit with the Lord, but eventually your body will be raised and, and rejoined to your soul and spirit, and you will be a complete human being in a glorified body. You know, no one in Christianity, not in true Christianity, doubts that reality. And yet many in Christianity would doubt the, the, the opposite reality that you already died with Christ. To them, that seems like abstract. That seems impossible that I could have been uh, identified with Christ in his death. I, I, I don't have nail prints in my hands. I, I, don't, I didn't die. I don't have, uh, that didn't happen to me. But when, when it comes to a future resurrection, we all have this hope. In fact, the Bible says if we don't have that hope, we are all men most miserable and to be pitied if there is no resurrection and so everyone in real Christianity looks forward to this future resurrection and doesn't doubt it at all, though it hasn't happened. I think what he's telling us is to look back and don't doubt your union with Christ at all either because it is as real as the other, and they are both real. Verse 9 says this, knowing that, that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. So Christ died for sin, died for sins once for all. And having been raised and dead, he will never die again. Christ died once and was raised from the dead once. And in these actions, he conquered death once for all. Once for all men for all time. He is victorious over death. It's reminiscent of 1 Corinthians 15 when he says this. In 1550, uh, 54, he says, But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? 
O death, where is your sting? And he says, the sting of death is sin, but, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through, Je through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ has been victorious over death forever. Death has lost its sting, and it has lost its sting for you. You will be raised, definitely be raised, without a doubt, because of Christ's victory over death. Death mastered Christ one time, but will never do so again. Christ now masters death, because Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 says he holds the keys to death and hell. And so anyone who has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ has been freed from future death, from future hell, because Christ has already unlocked that door for you. For the death that he died, he died to sin. Look at verse 10 of Romans 6. This is an important thing because... Um, there is a, more than one accomplishment in Christ's death on the cross. Um, in Christ's death on the cross, he died for our sins. Uh, as, a, as a sacrifice, a substitute, he died for our sins, plural. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and see the difference, of, uh, the difference that is being stated here. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died who pair for the, uh, as a substitute, in a sense, for our sins, plural. Now, look at that. Now, flip back over to Romans 6 verse 10 and see the difference that it's stated here verse 16 verse 10 says the death he died he died to sin once for all so you see the difference one he died for sins and here he died to sin so let's be thinking about that as we move forward he died to sin sin here is a singular noun Thus referring to the to indwelling sin or the sin nature, this sin singular. He died to it for you. In other words, you don't have to, you don't have to deal with the sin nature personally. In his, in his uh, death for you, he has dealt with sin singular. Just as he dealt with sins plural, taking the penalty of sin away in justification... But for your sanctification, he died to sin on your behalf. Once for all. One, one time for all time for all people. And so this should take away the striving that we often find ourselves in, in trying to be victorious over sin. You see, you don't have to defeat sin because in his death on your behalf, he has already dealt with sin for you. And I think this is extremely significant because if we will rest in who we are in Christ and His victories on our behalf, it can take a lot of striving away out of your life that is unnecessary, of trying to somehow or another overpower sin or somehow or another be victorious against the sin nature that is in you. He has dealt with it. He did it for you. Christ died for our sins in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 or 1 Peter 3, 18. But here Paul wrote that he also died to sin on our behalf. Romans 8, 3 says it this way. If you want to flip over to chapter 8, verse 3, this is how he says it. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. Now, my Bible has as an offering, but that is uh, added, helping, trying to help us understand. But actually, it says there, in the, the simple translation, the very literal translation was, God did 
sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. And the word for there is the, is the Greek word peri, which is an odd, um, odd Greek preposition to use here. But it has the idea of perimeter or round sin. Now, he, G, what, what, what the law couldn't deal, the law could not deal with sin singular in your life, with the sin nature. But God dealt with it, sending his son who per, put a, a parameter around it, cordoned it off. Why? In order, as it says there, or for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, that sin nature that is in your fleshly body is condemned. It's on death row. And so he has dealt with that for you. It's not gone yet, yet but it is under a, a condemnation curse. It will be destroyed. And so God has not left you to have to try to figure out how to deal with the sin nature and with sin in your life. Isn't it wonderful that the Lord didn't uh, just save you and say, good luck, see you on the other side. I hope you have a good life. And uh, it's going tr to be troublesome, but uh, somehow or another, you know, you'll get through. No, he actually dealt with the very evil that dwells in you. He dealt with Satan, for sure. He dealt with the world, didn't he? What about our sin nature? He has also dealt with the sin nature problem on your behalf. And the way he did it, is he took you into his death with him so that you would die to the whole realm of sin together with him. And you would be buried and you have the gulf of the, of the open tomb standing between you and, and sin of every form, but sin singular in particular. And so your sin nature has been severed, has been circumcised, but it's not gone. It's still there. It's kind of like the... The, 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 um, the young man that worked for McDonald's, he had a terrible boss. I mean, this boss made his life miserable. The kid would wipe the tables and he would yell at him, you didn't do good enough. He'd sweep the floors, you didn't do good enough. All day long just made this kid miserable. And then one day, the boss got a transfer. He was transferred across town to a different McDonald's. And he got a new boss. And this new boss had high standards as well. And he didn't like the tables messy, but he would, he would actually say, hey, let me show you how to wipe a table. And he'd take the rag and show him. He'd say, let me show you how to sweep the floor. And he'd help him. And if the, if the kid couldn't keep up, the boss would actually grab a, grab a broom and sweep as well. And, and so this kid began to flower under his new owner, I mean, his new manager. One day, though, he was in the, in the store there sweeping and in the McDonald's and he hears a, an old familiar voice, his old boss, and he's yelling, You dummy! You crazy guy! You are not sweeping good enough! And yelling at the kid, and the kid immediately you know, tried to do better, and then he realized, You're not my boss! And so he went back to doing what he knew would please his real boss. And the guy was just eating a meal there. Just thought he would pop in and see what was going on. Yet tried to rule his life. This is what the sin nature, its authority has been cut off from us, but it's not dead. As Colossians chapter 2 says, it's been circumcised. And in circumcision, the foreskin is removed from the body. And it is set aside to be later discarded. And this is what the Lord has done. He has, he's going to discard that in the resurrection. This is why Romans chapter 6 keeps talking about this future resurrection, in a sense, to let us know that there will be an an actual resurrection down the road. And, and in that, you will be delivered from the very presence of sin forever. And you won't have this beachhead of sin in you called the sin nature any longer. But for now, it's there. For now, you, we have it. But just understand that there has been a circumcision that has taken place. There has been, you have died to its realm and its authority, and now you are free to serve God, to, to live for God's purposes. And this is simply what he, what he is saying. But he wants you to understand that when Christ died on the cross, he didn't only die for sins, he died to sin as well. And in him, you were also dead to sin and alive unto God, verse 10. 
We do not have to die to sin, the sin nature ourselves because in his death on our behalf, he died to every form of sin, including sin singular or the sin nature. He died to sin once. Christ doesn't need to re-die. He died once. Therefore, in him, you died to the whole realm of sin as well. When he finished the work, he sat down because it was done. He died to sin once for all. His one death was for all of humanity, even though only the redeemed benefit. His one death was enough to liberate us from all forms of evil, including Satan, the world, sins plural, the sin nature. Every form of sin was dealt with. But the life that he lives now, he lives to God. And I think that's very important to understand because there are people who try to um, get you to focus only on the death of Christ. But we need to see that we've, we've got this package deal. You see, we did die with Christ, but we're not dead. We were buried with Christ, but we're not still dead. We've been raised up with Christ. We have ascended with Christ. We are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. And so we are now alive to God for God's purposes. And because of this very truth, he can say, set your affection on things above and not on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You see, this is who you are. You are dead to these things, but you are alive to God. So don't just stop at the death of Christ. Go on and enjoy the fact that you have been raised to newness of life in him. Now, do you know that we have gone six chapters and ten verses, and we have not had one directive for the Christian life to this point? We have not had one, um, one um, command so far in the book of Romans. That's amazing. Wouldn't it? What would you do with, the, with believers? If you were writing a, let, a letter to a church like Rome, you know, wouldn't you start out with, now be sure and attend church regularly. That'd be like the first paragraph. Now, and don't forget to give your 10%. And don't forget to, to bring your Bibles to church and, and quit going out and doing the worldly things that you've always done and stop doing this and start doing that. Isn't that what we do with a new believer? We, we give them, in fact, my dad was, uh, was uh, saved on a Sunday night and by Tuesday night the pastor was at his house and said, from now on, you're going to be going to church every time the door is open. From now on, you are going to give one-tenth of what you make in the offering. And, you are, and he laid down the law for my dad. My dad was a new believer, and so he kept it. And for years, he was trapped in a, in a system of do's and don'ts because of, of what the pastor did. He got saved on a Sunday night. He, and, and by Tuesday, he had, him, he had the law laid down for him. And this is what we do to people. Wouldn't it be much better if we took the time to really lay out like Paul has done in this long, elongated uh, teaching of who you are in Christ and what has happened before you get ready to go to Romans 6.11 and give the first command. Because that's what we're fixing to see. And not only are we going to see the first command in the book of Romans, we're going to find out it is not at all the command that anybody hardly even gives you during all of your Christian life. You hardly hear anybody teaching that you must do what he's about to tell you to do. But you're going to see something very important. So let's finish up verse 10. The life that Christ lives, present tense, he lives to God and to God alone. He has been raised. Now he is strictly alive for God's purposes. He's never going to meddle with sin again, even though he didn't meddle with it, but it was placed on him but that was that's done he his his resurrection life now is strictly for god's purposes his resurrection life is the basis of your power to live the christian life that is your basis now because you are now in the living christ you are not only dead to sin 
but are also marvelously alive unto God. And so we've gone six chapters and ten verses, and we haven't seen a command, so it's time to get the commands rolling. What do you say? Let's take about three minutes and hook up. Uh, Jaime, if you need to run to the restroom real quick, go ahead and take advantage of this opportunity. <laughs>